Uh, welcome to another episode of the Nuclear Medicine Molecular Medicine podcast. And we're just leading up to the uh, annual Society of Nuclear Medicine meeting in Chicago. Unfortunately, I can't be there, but I plan on being there virtually and talking to uh, lots of people and getting some uh, good podcasts done along there. But the Society of Nuclear Medicine um, recently um, uh, uh, published, uh, I thought was a really uh, Really cool and interesting article. I thought it was just fun, and but also also quite practical. Um, and uh, so we're going to talk a little bit uh, about that. Um, Associate Professor Prax um, from Stanford um, is going to talk to us a little bit about about what he done. Um, so uh, so Gilliam, can, can you tell us a little, little bit about who you are and where you're from? And uh, yeah. Hi, Rob. Yeah. So yeah, to start, you know, it's a pleasure to be on on your podcast here. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, I'm happy to share my, uh, my my work and the recent paper we published. So, um, so yeah, I'm, I'm currently a, a research professor at Stanford University, where I'm uh, working uh, leading a, a lab uh, in radiation oncology. Um, you know, our, our research focuses on different areas. Uh, one area that has been, I guess, a major focus of our, of our work has been looking at uh, whether we can use single cell methods in nuclear medicine, right? So this is a kind of a, a uh, I would say maybe surprising idea because, you know, when we do nuclear medicine, we're thinking about organs and uh, thinking about, you know, patients or, or animals, but you can actually go down and also look at single cells with nuclear medicine methods. And, uh, and we'll probably talk more about this, but uh, yeah, so I have a lab here at Stanford in California and uh, you know, we train a number of students and postdocs. And uh, so, yeah, it's, uh, you know, been going well. And we, we also do uh, in vivo pet imaging, another thing where we also look at single cells in vivo. So that's a probably different work we could talk about another day. But um, Sounds yeah. right. Um, I, um, so, so tell us a little bit about what you've done. I, I mean, the, 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 the eye-catching part of your talk was that you uh, developed an imaging system for $100. <laughs> Which I know is less than, <laughs> than, than so, what we normally expect, but uh, but I, I think uh, I think actually the research utility of what you've done, I mean, given that it's a hundred dollars, I think it's very uh, uh, translatable to lots of other sites. But yeah. but I won't steal your thunder. Perhaps tell us a little bit about what you what sure. you and, and before I, I start, you know, I want to credit, you know. Uh, Two, two wonderful trainees in my lab, so uh, Justin Klein, who really came up with this idea, and Tejin Kim, who also worked hard to kind of make it come to fruition. Um, and uh, yeah, so just to set up kind of the story, you know, uh, so years ago, we, we had built a, a very fancy microscope that, that was able to image, um, you know, our common radio tracers in, uh, in single cells, right? So you can think about, you know, your FTG, your FLT, you know, different different pet tracers <clears throat> and the idea being you know you you could actually zoom in on single cells look at the uptake of different cells of of, of these radio tracers right and uh, i think the main goal you know was to uh, you know look at differences between cells how they they take up radio tracers and try to understand you know where, where the radio tracer really going if you have, you know if you have a tumor is it really going to the tumor cell or is it maybe being taken up by macrophages or other cells in the tumor right um, or the surrounding. So, so you've got you've got things like FAPI, for example, which is FAPI exactly, yeah, and, going to fibroblasts, yeah, and you know, because sometimes you know you're not necessarily interested just in tumor cells, but like the tracer is actually maybe targeting the macro environment, the, the the other cells around it, and so you really want to try and understand the mechanism of these tracers and looking at the single cell level, and we built a microscope. It's an instrument that first takes the radi radiation from the tracer, converts it into light, and then this very faint light emission is kind of funneled towards a uh, an objective and a very sensitive camera that costs like forty thousand dollars, right? And then you make an image of that, and you can see the cells. You know, it's beautiful. You see the cell. You can see where the tracer is gone inside the cell, um, and allows you to sort of at least study in in, uh, in labor laboratory uh, different tracers. Of course, this is not to, you know something you do in the patient, right? You do that in the lab using cell culture or different type of tissues. Uh, but then, so you know, Justin came along and you know realized this is really expensive microscope. You know, I think it's very complicated, and he had this this idea to use instead a uh, commercial grade uh, sensor 
which you know is being built you know in million pieces like a million items being being made right in huge factories uh for for a cost of twenty five dollars a piece right so it's very inexpensive sensors um and the idea is kind of cut out the middleman so instead of creating light and trying to detect the light we're trying to detect directly the radioactive emissions from from the tracer so the beta particles positrons um and the idea is that we we, we actually took the sensor we strip off the, the the lens we strip off everything from the sensor that's you know the autofocus and everything um there's a lens array and then just just have a very thin layer on top of the 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 sensor array and then grow cells directly on that sensor right so $25 sensor uh, and then after that you can introduce radio tracer and the cells will take up the radio tracer and as the radio tracer decays, the, the radiation will hit the little pixels in the sensor. And then you can start to make images out of that. And, and surprisingly, you know, we we're able to get really beautiful images with that $25 sensor. Um, and so the cost of $100 that includes the computer and you know, like maybe some of the other accessories that you need to, to make it work. But pretty much, you know, we 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 able to do you know really beautiful imaging with a very large field of view of about one centimeter by one centimeter. And you could look at hundreds of cells in this setup, right? Right. Um, so, 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 in the old days, well, we we still do. We put film in, in front of tissue and and yeah. post film, and then uh, and and uh, and produce an image that way. I guess it's a bit more like that, isn't it? Some ways. Yeah, I guess you know you could say it's it's a form of autoradiography. I think that's what you you yes, you're referring to with using film. It is, and uh, I think. Um, you know, worth it. Back, it gets maybe a little bit better than autoradiography. Is you know, you you're getting a, a digital image, um, and you know, you you can do some you know, real time processing on the data you're getting to try to clean up the images, uh, localizing single decays, like trying to improve localization of these events, and um, and by doing that, you know, trying to improve resolution, right? Because when you want to go to single cell, resolution is really critical, uh, and so. You know the idea is we we have enough resolution. You know we can visualize single cells, right? You can see uh, population of cell and, and measure the activity within each single cell. Um, so that's you know that's the yeah it is a form of digital autoradiography. Uh, right, but you've got one of in auto radiography. Once that bit of film's exposed, you really can't count right. more, more information from that piece of film. Right. right, but in your case, you can continue to count more information. In you could reuse it. Case. You can reuse it. And also the other thing is we're imaging live cells, right? With autoradiography, it's not really designed to do live cell imaging. You know, you have long exposure time, typically like a few hours. Um, this is like a maybe a you know 10 minute exposure, get an image. It's very sensitive. Um, and you know, I think you know it's certainly a lot cheaper than autoradiography. Um yes. and it's you know, the purpose is very specific, right? It's to look at uh, heterogeneity within populations of cells, right? Cancer cells. I mean, there, you know, there are a lot of people who have contacted us looking, you know, wanting to look in the brain, you know, different cells within the brain and trying to understand how how they interact with different radio tracers, right? Um, with uh, theranostics, we're also wanting to look at, um, you know, where, where is the therapeutic agent going to, right? And and trying to do microdosimetry, perhaps. Uh, so, so yeah, it is a very interesting instrument. We we actually made it open source. Um, so, so you know, the, the idea was the code is available online. You know, the how to build it is available online. All the all the parts needed, all commercially available. Um, so, at this stage, it's basically you know we have instruction. People can build their own. Maybe eventually, you know, maybe we could make it more of a of a commercial product that people can can buy. But right now, it's you know, it's, it's been essentially open sourced for for everybody to to use it if they want. Yeah. Right now, at the moment, we've got a range of theranostics. Um, some of them are beta, some of them are alpha. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so, so the debate is which ones do you use with what type of theranostic? Is it uh, for alpha's got a very short range, so it it mm -hmm. may actually uh, penetrate into a cell if if the if the theranostic isn't targeting the actual Cancer, mm. rather it's targeting the uh 
the environment around the cell. And that's what I mentioned about FAPI, for example, right, which is right. targeting the area around the cell. Um, so you, so I, is an alpha labeled FAPI going to work because is it going to get really to the to the cancer cells? Well, are you better off with a beta? Um, uh, is changing the microenvironment around the cell to enhance the immune system, like some of the immune-based theranostics that we're seeing, mm-hmm. some of the zirconium ones? Um, are they going to uh, are they going to um, uh, make a difference? So I think it's actually serious science and very useful. I don't. I, I, I wouldn't trivialize what you're doing. Yeah, I, I think you're perfectly right. I think alphas are very interesting because you know specifically they they're you know. They deposit energy very locally, so we need to know exactly which cells are taking them up, and uh, so that we can have reliable dosimetry, right? When we we do that in patients, um, so yeah, yeah. So really useful, and I think I think one of what, one of the coolest things, and it's something that really you could do anywhere. I mean, now at that cost, you just do, you've got to have a bit of will to get get on and do it. You've you've detailed all of the products that you use, mm-hmm. and, and I think sometimes it's useful to do that. We talked briefly before about how we open sourced the original PSMA trials in Australia, where, uh, uh, which meant that suddenly there was an explosion of its use all around the world. Uh, mm-hmm. because there wasn't held up by IP challenges or, or a single company. Uh, lots of companies are doing PSMA at the moment. Um, so I think I think there's uh, I think uh, kudos to you for actually <laughs> actually doing that. I think that's uh, that's a great gift, and I think this is. Super useful. Um, um, is there anything else you'd like to add? How, tell me a little bit about your your pet camera. How does that pet work in terms of in terms of your micro cell stuff? So, so I couldn't quite catch the last one. You said you're um, doing pet imaging in in the cell as well. Uh, how, oh, in vivo. Yes. Or, yes. Yes. Sure. Yeah. I, I, you know. So this is a you know something also we've done over a few years, and. So now, you know, we're kind of moving in vivo, right? Because I think we've done a lot of work in vitro, but I think in vivo is where things are interesting. And, uh, you know, if I asked you, what's the smallest number of cells you can image with PET in a, in a let's say, a mouse, for instance, what, what would you say? You know, would that be a thousand, a million? Um, Probably a million, I guess, yeah. A million, yeah. So so we, we've shown you can actually see a single cell in, in, a, in a mouse. So it's not yet, you know, in the clinic using a, whole body scanner, but it's right. in the mouse with a high sensitivity PET scanner. Um, you can non-invasively detect the location of a single cell and you can track its migration if it's migrating from one place to another place, right? Um, so this is also very interesting. And um, you know, how do you, you get around the positron path like this year? Um, positron path is about a millimeter. So you still can localize that cell within, you know, about a millimeter accuracy. Right. Uh, the idea is, you know, if, if you tag this, that one cell, you don't tag any other cells, of course. Right. Then you have enough signal in there actually to 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 detect that one cell, and you can track it as it's, you know. So we're looking at metastasis, for instance, where you can track single cancer cells going to the bloodstream and then to the heart, and then eventually resting into the lungs, where it may or may not create a metastasis. Right. So you can see that with with PET, which is I think it's you know probably the you know very high level of sensitivity that you get with those radio tracers, right? That, that's what allows it. So that's amazing. I mean, I think that I think we'll have to w- w- when you publish that, we'll have to talk some more. But I, I think that sure. the, the um, I think it's it's the, the the one beauty is, and I say to people about theranostics, it's very hard to do radiotherapy on a single cell. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> and uh, and and that's what we actually do when we do theranostics. So I think that's yep. the key examples is that is that uh, in, in nuclear medicine we go we go from the macro to the absolute micro in terms mm-hmm. in terms of what we were treating. But now we can actually go from to the absolute micro in terms of what we're seeing as wow. well. And I think that is fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Well done. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. Is there anything else you'd like to add before we close? Um, no, I mean, it's a pleasure being here. You know, I hope we maybe catch up one of the conferences one of these days. And, uh, you know, thanks a lot for this opportunity to discuss our research. Yeah.